I'm going to uh, bring three thought leaders to the stage. And um, while you all are getting situated, I know folks are moving around in the back, I want you to consider what it means to have money and meaning uh, touch your life in a way in which you have the opportunity to touch other people's lives and what banking has looked like, who banking is for, what that conversation has felt like uh, over the years here in coordinating and producing SOCAP, but in your own personal lives and where you, where you live, in the places that you live. So we have Kat Taylor, who is the co-founder and CEO of Beneficial State Bank, who is joining us. You all can clap it up for, for Kat. When I asked her, you know, what makes her come alive and what she's thinking about right now, she just gave me a little bit of a snippet around her thoughts around if we don't deal with and address head on uh, the issues of, of direct uh, investment in our community, there aren't any systems around philanthropy that can fix that. And so, you know, as an innovator, uh, in the Bay Area and across the country and throughout the world. Uh, her work is at the intersection of culture and social justice and money. And so we welcome you to the stage again this year, Kat. Also, Andrea Armini, who is the executive director of Transform Finance. Uh, Andrea is someone who I met some years ago at uh, the beginning of the conversation in the design of Impact Hub Oakland. Uh, his deep thoughtfulness around hope and, and what it means to like dig deeply into the conversation of equity has really shaped my understanding of how the transforming conversation of how we pull the thread on finance and who that conversation is for is deeply important. So please welcome Andrea Armini to the stage as well. Y'all can make some clapping, some hooting, some hollering, all of those things. And then Robin Vargesi, who is the head of partner engagement, um, lead investor and lead uh, strategist at Open Society Foundation as well. He lives in Brooklyn, so y'all, you, you always have to just represent when you're on the left coast, when the Brooklyn people show up for us. I asked him what was giving him hope uh, backstage, and he said, you know, I'm really inspired by mass mobilization of people coming to do experiments and getting to their own thing uh, and bring it, just bringing the fire to us. And so please wel welcome Robin to the stage as well. Thanks, you, Sheriff. Thank you, Ashara. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us for this uh, quick afternoon chat. We want to keep it informal because the topic is fairly heavy. <laughs> the way that we've been looking at this, and some of you have heard uh, all of us probably in different ways framing the issue as one of looking at the plumbing and the structural issues around finance that are problematic. So it's not just a matter of the what gets invested in, but the how who gets to make those decisions, who gets to take the residual value that companies uh, um, create, and more fundamentally really thinking who owns what and what does it mean to own something. This is a somewhat uncomfortable conversation perhaps, right? We, we are by and large in a position of ownership, but if we're really serious about the transformative aspect of the work and uh, and reshaping who wins and gets to, and who loses in, uh, in society through capital and through economic activity, and then we need to take a bit of a harder look at ownership. And ownership traditionally is a set of rights that you have over the, um, the value that is being created, but also over the decision making that affects us. And generally, as you know, it's something that goes on in perpetuity if you are an equity investor or if you own a piece of land. Now, we don't really stop and question that, by and large. We think, yeah, it's almost a God-given right, you know? And uh, if we think back to the work of Marjorie Kelly in her book, uh, The Divine Right of Capital, it very much started raising that question for all of us. Why is it that it's the 
investors, that is the owners, as it were, of a company, the ones that get to make decisions that affect a lot of uh, other groups of stakeholders. Why them? It's in case, in, uh, in case law in the United States, but it's not a law of nature by, by any stretch. So we have been questioning that and seeing if it's the type of paradigm that eventually really needs to change, that uh, it's not sufficiently justified. Um, and if it were to be justified, then we would be okay with that, right? If somebody were to say, well, here is why this makes sense. Decisions that are affecting all of us will be made by a small group of us. And as Marjorie was looking at it, she said, well, this is very akin to aristocracy, right? And uh, to the way in which decisions were made in medieval and post-medieval England, where a certain number of people would get to vote just because they were the ones that owned the land. And it wasn't question until it was. So I start from the standpoint that it is possible to change this, and change is coming. The moment is now to have this conversation. Many of you heard uh, Anand this morning. You heard Jed Emerson. With the rising wave of populism, this is, uh, uh, this is increasing. And I want to think of it specifically from one angle, that is the increased role of the corporation in our life. Right? We're no longer talking about something that is fundamentally private, and you say, okay, the ones that started it or put the capital in get to make the decisions. This is something that will affect uh, all of us more broadly, right? If Apple has a trillion dollar market cap, right, they're way bigger than a lot of countries in the world, and why is it just that just the owners of the capital, the ones that have invested as shareholders in Apple, get to make those, uh, those decisions? So we want to explore a little bit the why, of the need to reconceive ownership, but also some of the models that have come up, because this is not an abstract question, right? There are ways in which we can start thinking differently about governance, thinking differently about who gets the value, and thinking differently, in, in my particular uh, obsession, about the perpetuity of a capital investment, right? That you invest capital at the beginning, and by and large, you keep on reaping the benefits of that in perpetuity, regardless of your not having put any more um, effort beyond the initial effort or that initial risk. By alternative ownership, what do we mean? All of you are probably familiar with uh, employee ownership, right? As an alternative to just capital, even though there is a, a shifting of who owns the shares, right? So uh, you're turning the employees into owners of shares, so it's still uh, a similar form of ownership. You've heard of platform co-ops, probably, where the users of a particular platform, like it could be Uber, it could be Twitter, would be the ones that get to make the decisions on it and, uh, uh, and get the, the residual value from, uh, uh, from that. So looking at some of the models that break down and reconceive who gets to make the decisions, who gets the value for how long, and, uh, and why. So that's what we'll explore over the next 20 or so minutes. I'll tell you, I can, I wanted to sort of explain how we got to this issue. Um, so, the Open Society Foundations is not uh, a development agency. Um, we are not in the business of poverty relief or poverty alleviation. Um, and we're not in the business of strict economic development. So it's interesting that we wind up with a program which does work on all of those things. Um, so how do we get here? At some point, you know, we came to the realization uh, the, the, operation, the practical realization, not just the intellectual one, that economic power, like political power, can oppress or liberate. And basically, that the arc of economic power had, could be bent to social justice, or needed to be bent to social justice, especially in contexts where it's going the other way. Right? So our, we're a global foundation, we work in over 140 countries, and many of those countries, in the pursuit of open society, meaning tolerant, pluralistic, open, democratic ones, and a lot of the indicators are going the other way. What is the role of development in all of this, right? And so the role of development in all of this was that uh, basically the institutions, the economic institutions and structures of a society were fostering a kind of politics which were anti-democratic. 
So what is, what did this, how did this lead to the question of ownership itself? And, and this is where we started to th think about what did the institutions of a just society look like, right? And, and here, we too started focusing on the intellectual question of what is ownership. And ownership is basically effective power over something, over an asset. It's the ability to use it however you want. It's the ability to claim its value add, which, uh, it's, and its ability to transfer it whichever way you like, regardless of impacts on, on others. And so concentrations of power and of income and wealth are very good proxies for concentrations of power. Right? And that's, at the heart of all of this is a deeply political question, right? Which is, how do we, if, if economic power is an input into political power ultimately and social power, how do we address its maldistributions without addressing the maldistributions of economic power? And that led us to this question of ownership, not simply its distribution, but how it's structured in all its dimensions across multiple parties. And so that's how we wound up with our body of work in this space, which is, in, which is nascent, um, but we work in. But we've started to work in uh, a number of issue areas around employee ownership and community ownership, um, around what should be the structure of these digital platforms, which especially in the global south, are organizing labor markets, especially informal labor markets, in very intense and complicated ways. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a recent journey for the foundation, but it's kind of an exciting one, which has galvanized much of, our, much of the foundation's work on democracy. Um, I guess I would say, how can we not look at structural change at this point? Um, so we're hurtling towards climate disaster. We have, uh, the, in those areas, where racial caste systems are still determining economic outcomes to the detriment of many, many people. We have a counterbalance on the other side of people who might be coming into the middle class but have no political self-determination. We have rampant poverty, and poverty, to my way of thinking, is not God-given and not self-generated. It is societally imposed, and it's super expensive. Desperation is bad for all of us. Uh, we are threatening social chaos and control states and fascism, not only in many countries of the world, but some of the most powerful. And if you ask me if this economy has been successful, of course I have to listen particularly to the financiers who point to how much wealth has been created. But it's been created for very few and taken away from the many. So a dollar invested in 1980 in the stock market is worth $20 now, but a dollar of wages in 1980 is still about a dollar today. One third of uh, workers in the United States work full time and still meet the federal definition of poverty. It's just, it should be about one in two by 2020. And half of California's children are growing up in poverty now in the richest state in the world. So that isn't acceptable to any of us, and I think we have to look uh, to the fundamental institutions of society who are responsible for creating those outcomes. And that begins, in our case, with banking and finance, and moves quickly into business and the economy. Uh, capitalism is an agnostic system. The rules are not created by the laws of physics. They're created by human beings. And if we ha allow concent uh, concentrations of power, they tend to create the rules of capitalism in favor of further concentration of power. We have adverse natural selection in our corporate leadership. Essentially, whatever, whoever's willing to do the absolute worst things to the planet and people gets elevated. Uh, and the shareholders benefit from it without actually accepting responsibility for it. So enough of the Debbie Downer stuff. I actually am an optimist, and I feel optimistic because I think this kind of darkness is always what happens before the dawn, um, and that we have the ability to recreate society and business and the economy uh, with structures that are much more favorable to egalitarianism, to self-determination, and to uh, plenty for all, um, and the best place to work and live for all as well. So by day, 
I'm the CEO of a bank. I'm very lucky in the company that I keep. We're about a billion dollars in assets, 250 employees and 17 branch offices. Uh, it's called Beneficial State Bank. That was chosen to indicate that we can all be in a beneficial state of mind and body. Um, it's a triple bottom line bank model. Uh, serving social justice and environmental well-being at the same time that we're economically uh, sustainable, if not competitive in bank markets. We don't get a break. We still have to compete well and uh, earn a profit. Um, there are three design features of the bank that put it in that new construct of ownership. Um, first and foremost is an ownership model that uh, is allegiant to multiple stakeholders. We don't believe that the business of corporations is to maximize profit for the equity shareholder. We absolutely reject that. Uh, absolutely reject that. Our stakeholders include customers, our colleagues, the communities in which we operate, the uh, planet, and the public at large. And we uh, are an optimization model. We don't allow maximization for any one of those stakeholders. In order to ensure that, the bank, 100% uh, of the economic rights of the bank are owned by a public charity foundation that's permanently governed in the public interest. This is as close as a bank as we could get to the cooperative model of a credit union, which is member-owned and driven. Um, in this case, we know uh, that our shareholders, our economic shareholders, will pitch us right out if we don't serve the public interest. Um, in addition to that, uh, the most powerful thing about banking is the lending practice. We think of banking as the original and most powerful form of crowdfunding. Not that a specific deposit fi funds a specific loan, but all deposits fund a lending practice. And those deposits are crowdsourced. They're about 12 trillion in the US economy. They come from everybody. Um, and the crowd is wise. We have to surmise what they want, but we're pretty sure they want us to lend to a new economy that's fully inclusive racially and gender just, and environmentally restorative. Uh, so we're constraining that lending practice to produce 75% of loans that uh, increase what we really need, like affordable housing and renewable energy, or borrowers who are also aligned in the public interest and cooperatively governed, uh, and voices that have been left out of the, of the economy to date. Because those who have... Uh, experienced and survived the material and psychological consequences of extreme oppression have the best insights about how to self-organize. And in this country, having started in slavery, native genocide, less in personhood for half the people, and persecution of immigrants and refugees, we have no shortage of brilliant communities who know how uh, we should reorganize society. The last design feature is just radical transparency. We should get to know everything a corporation is doing, and we're no exception. So for instance, we pay 150% of living wage to all employees fully benefited in an industry where one third of bank tellers are on some form of public assistance. Uh, so more, I, I think, uh, the lesson of the bank is that we have to strive for a new ownership model that's as close as we can come to uh, a cooperative. At, uh, both run by our uh, customers and with input from our colleagues, that some ownership, some things in life uh, need always to be owned by the employees and the participants, and some things should never be owned at all because they're part of the ecological commons. Um, I know we'll talk about that later. I'm really taken by the, by the, gover by the, the governance. And, you know, a lot of our work is um, aiming towards forms like cooperatives and trusts and ESOPs, at least democratic ESOPs. Um, but I'm also struck by what's happening in this country. You know, for, now I, I'm, I'm an old, in, my, in a previous life I was a scholar of what we used to be called in the 60s and 70s economic democracy. And there were, there were movements in uh, the United States and Western Europe to basically have greater stakeholder voice in, in, in the governance of systems. And so and you still see this in places like Germany, where at least in large firms and many sectors, workers elect somewhere between a third to 50 minus 1%, 50% minus 1 of, the board, of supervisory boards and have representation at the operational management level through works councils and things like that. And it, it really has, you know, there, there's a zeitgeist um, 
in which people, where the concept is being broken up because one thing that people are feeling that it's not working. But I think we should also think about uh, the question of how do you get multiple, the perspectives of multiple stakeholders, many of whom who can't be there in these mm -hmm. organizations themselves, right? And so, you know, I don't know how many of you are, how many people are familiar with the Mondragon Corporation, which is um, a large cooperative network in northern Spain, 75,000 workers, about 18 billion euros a year in turnover. So it's, it's not quite global Fortune 500. Organized as a, as a network of cooperatives. But it still has large supply chains across the global south where everyone doesn't have a voice. And so some mix of where the mission is embedded in the, the, the institution itself. So when we think about voice, there are multiple ways of representing voice. And you might need multiple forms of representing voice in order to embed it in an organization, in, or to especially embedded in corporations which are very global. It's obviously easier with smaller locally bound ones where communities and workers can have, have, have that kind of voice. And uh, I, think, I think in those kinds of experiments which we see across many parts of the United States, I mean, you see like networks emerging in the Bronx and Cleveland and Chicago, you know, Los Angeles and, and also like rural parts like Western North Carolina, we find, you know, a sort of a feverish series of experiments. And that's because something's gone wrong, right? Yeah, and maybe with that, I, I want to get concrete for a second because we're, we're not talking about craziness here, right? Both, uh, both Kat and Robin are actively working on this. And we at Transform Finance sit in a particularly fortunate position where as a field builder, we have a mandate from a variety of stakeholders that have said, yeah, we want to look at the work that we do, especially on the investment side, through a different lens, right? What is the engagement of all the relevant stakeholders in the design, in the governance, and the ownership? How can we make sure that we're creating more value than what is being taken out by the investors? And how do we make sure that the risk is falling adequately and fairly on the various stakeholders based on the, how able they are to bear that risk? So they said, okay, we all agree that there is a problem with traditional ownership. We all agree that the way that most mainstream impact investing even is looking at it is not even coming close to the issue of wealth inequality, of power inequality. So what is out there? So I wanted to mention quickly three models that I think are interesting to look at uh, right now. The first one that will be featured tomorrow, I think, as part of the alternative ownership track is the trust or purpose or steward ownership model. Uh, it's something that is not new, right? A lot of the new stuff is old. The Bosch Corporation in Germany did this about 100 years ago when it said, no, the, the corporation will not be owned just for the benefit of the shareholders in that Dodge versus Ford uh, American uh, common law approach, but it will be held in a trust that will vote the shares for the benefit of a variety of stakeholders. And uh, Purpose Capital, um, that uh, is now pioneering this reinvention of the steward ownership model, uh, is doing a series of transactions right now to convert existing companies to a steward-owned model where uh, multi-stakeholders that are relevant to the corporation, and that can be its employees, but it can also be its supply chain, it can be the customers, the core customers, all get a vote and all get a part of the economic value that is being created by the company. So that's one of the most concrete examples that we have seen of a new approach to ownership, where you're distributing the governance and you're distributing the, um, uh, the ownership value. The second one, which is a little bit funkier even, um, goes to the point of, um, of the perpetuity of the capital, right? This idea that you go in, early stage investor, buy a bunch of shares, and then you're still sitting on those shares and deriving value well after your initial $500,000 has done its course, right? A lot of people have contributed more. The workers have contributed, but once they leave the corporation, they no longer get any value. Why is it that you continue to get it? So the alternative to that is a model that we saw called self-diluting equity, where you would have a company with a fairly traditional equity ownership structure, but every six months, the company issues the equivalent of 50% of its current equity and distributes it according to who has contributed 
to the well-being of that company over the last six months, right? You can think of Facebook having been set up like that from the beginning, where it said, OK, here's the initial capital. Something good was done with that. But then management contrib contributed to it. The users contributed to it. The advertisers contributed to it. And therefore, they all should get an equity share. And the initial capital will still be there, but it's percentage will be diluted in correspondence to the fact that they are now contributing less to, um, uh, to, to the ongoing well-being of the, of the company. And the third, which I think is very important for impact investors that think of it in terms of uh, maximizing uh, risk-adjusted returns uh, in, uh, to meet the market and whatnot, is this idea of the capped uh, returns on equity, which I think is something a CAT and a Beneficial State Bank have been looking at and saying, look, at the, at the starting moment, right, when you start your company, it's worth zero. You own 100% of the shares. And you think, what if we had a big exit? What if this thing worked really well? Do I need more than $30 million, let's say? No, probably most people would be happy with an exit like that. So you set that number and you say, anything beyond that, we can divide into a pool, right? I would be very happy, frankly, personally, if I had a $30 million exit. Now that my company is worth zero, I'm thinking, if that day ever comes, I'm totally happy for the rest to be distributed across everybody that has contributed to this. It could be the workers, it could be the, the customers, right, in the way that Reddit did with one of its raises for its user. It could be anybody else. But there's no reason why all that value should accrue to me just by virtue of my continued share, uh, share ownership of it. One of the things you know, that we are doing, um, also in partnership with Transform Finance, is trying to look at what kind of financial structures can facilitate the transfer of businesses from, from their owners to their workers and communities, right? And so, and this has become sort of an important question um, with lots of policy interest um, and public interest because the baby boomers are retiring and exiting from, depending on how you value it, say 10-ish trillion, 12-ish trillion dollars worth of assets, the small medium enterprise space. This is an, this is an opportunity that, that many actors, you know, are excited about because it's basically a win-win, right? I mean, it's sort of uh, these people want to sell their assets. Many of them will, will have a hard time finding buyers, helping to organize buyers who are, uh, who are people that they know, who've been their employees, becomes a viable solution, uh, especially when the prospect, when the other prospect is shutting down the firm altogether and not having it sold, a viable asset orphaned and shut down. And you know, and this is, there's, there's no small design challenge in this because what, what's needed is, is a, a financing vehicle which has the risk profile of equity but the control profile of debt, right? And so, and this is sort of a space which, you know, we can, uh, where, where a different kind of investor or an investor who thinks differently can play. But I think we should be clear about problems which we think have where, where we're always in search of win-win solutions, right? Win-win solutions are basically fundamentally technical solutions, right? And there's a limit to how far a technical solution can solve a political problem. If we think that fundamentally that the, that the problem of the concentration of the structure of ownership is a political problem, there's only so far solutions like the ones we're pursuing, you know, admittedly, can take us, and that's something I think we shouldn't lose sight of, right? And at some point, if we think economic inequality has gotten to intolerable levels, or levels which are dangerous for a democracy, re-addressing that means that some people will not be on the winning side of things necessarily. Hmm. I, I'm glad we're getting to what I think is at the root of all this, which is power. I know we talk about money and capital and equity and everything else, but I think it is power and uh, these opportunities to redistribute power depend on us acquiring the power to do it to begin with. That's the political nature of the problem. So to my view, capital has been beating up on labor for centuries. Uh, capital is inanimate 
it's, it doesn't have an inherent value to society. Whereas labor, that's people, and we aren't just labor. We also we create value through our work, uh, through our voting, through where we shop and what we shop for, uh, through the families that we care for. So we're much more um, in terms of value creation than just our work implies. Um, so I would rather favor a situation where people are rewarded for all those constructive activities than continuing to reward capital that's inanimate. And if you look at what's happening in this year alone, we just the Tax Relief Act just gave a huge tax benefit to corporations in which capital is concentrated. Um, even Opportunity Zones, which I know you just heard about, uh, are a hierarchical model of imposing capital on communities that are designated in a deficit way um, and without lacking any sort of mechanism so far for community input, much less control. So you can imagine that capital doing something good, like creating affordable housing, uh, job creation, small business formation, etc. But that likely takes constraints by the community in which the capital lands. And remember, that capital is coming off of long-term capital gains. Those who have long-term capital gains tend to be financial first and only investors. It's not likely that they're going to constrain the return that they're seeking based on community input, community benefit, uh, and a multi-stakeholder ownership model. Um, so we have to be really careful about that, that it doesn't create luxury housing that displaces, fracking, other polluting industries, private prisons, you name it. Um, I think we have a unique opportunity right now to steal power back because the world globally connected but lacking local accountability has produced massive network effects, not just the telephone and the internet. And you all know that a network effect is created when the participation of each additional member increases the value for all members. So social platforms like Facebook, even shopping platforms like Amazon, the banking system itself, electoral politics, civilization is a form of network effect. So how can we use our power of creation through participation and defection to uh, get to some of these goals uh, to, uh, of either uh, self-limiting equity, self-liquidating equity, or trust models? And so I would argue that we have a unique chance to uh, impose after the fact some of those limitations on capital because we can threaten to leave. Facebook right now is facing that threat quite specifically because of the use of personal information. Um, you saw that they bought Instagram and WhatsApp. That's likely because they're worried that if all of us defect from one social platform, they need to hold another one that, to which we might go. But that's the kind of market cap that could go away overnight, and everyone's aware of that. The same for a run on the banks. Uh, that's why we have FDIC insurance, to prevent that. So how can we use that power not to use it literally, but to ex uh, exact some of these concessions for community-based control and ownership? Um, I, I think in our world, we're looking at more and more possibilities for worker cooperatives and uh, ex uh, preferentially according finance to those worker co-ops. We would consider ourselves becoming a worker co-op or some sort of employee-controlled bank. Um, the, I think about uh, in agriculture, soils are actually a collective asset. They shouldn't be owned, they should only be stewarded. So how can we redesign agriculture away from an industrial system to one that's cooperatively managed? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>